This is the central conference of the Wikimedia movement. It is called Wikimania, and it is where people aspire to create a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. This is where people share their ideas, engage in discussions, and come up with innovation. And in our case, ideas soon become part of reality. This event is all about people, people like you. This year, Wikimedia Israel is proud to host Wikimania in Haifa, one of Israel's largest cities, the Mediterranean gateway to the regions of Mount Carmel and the Galilee, where human history stretches deep into the past and technology centers show the path to the future. During the three days ahead of us, we are going to have more than 125 sessions in five simultaneous tracks and discuss the future of our projects and new initiatives all around the world. But it's not all about straining our brains. We're also here to get together and enjoy social events with people whom we don't often see face to face. So get ready to enjoy three fascinating days. And don't forget to tag your tweets and your uploads to Wikimedia Commons and Flickr with the Wikimania tags. Welcome to Haifa and enjoy Wikimania 2011. Shalom, Wikimania. It's a delight to welcome everyone here. It's a delight to open the 2011 Wikimania meeting here at Haifa. I'm Shezaf Rafaeli. I'm from the University of Haifa and the Sagi Center. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of the delegates from over 56 countries. I understand now over 650 participants in what is already the largest Wikimania ever, and as Jimmy Wales indicated yesterday, going to be the best Wikimania ever. <laughs> it's a pleasure to uh, offer thanks and gratitude to the large number of institutions and individuals who put together the work and the determination and the commitment to make, make this conference possible. possible. First and foremost, of course, the Wikimedia Foundation and the Wikimedia Movement, whose values are represented in this conference and may be elevated yet one more step in this year when we're celebrating 10 years for Wikipedia. So thank you to the Foundation and its activists and to the movement and its members. It's a pleasure to thank the municipality of Haifa for hosting this event and making it possible. Uh, the contributions of the municipality are numerous and they're evident all around and it's very well organized and uh, the hospitality is well appreciated. I would like to thank the Foreign Ministry of uh, Israel for their contribution and support. I'd like to acknowledge the assistance of the Israel Internet Association. Uh, the notebooks uh, that they handed out this morning, I hope, will be filled out with written stuff that will eventually become digital. It's interesting that the Internet Association is handing out dead wood. <laughs> Acknowledging Answers.com, major sponsor of this event, and Ask.com. I want to thank Titan College uh, for making the uh, party last night as pleasurable as it was, a uh, great atmosphere. I wish to acknowledge the assistance from the Jerusalem Development Corporation, Babylon, the University of Haifa that provided uh, assistance in a variety of sorts. I wish to uh, uh, say a few uh, words for uh, Benny Moran and Media Productions, uh, who are doing all the background work to make us tick on time. Benny made sure that I have an accurate watch, not just that I look at the watch, but I actually follow the time, so thank you, Benny. Uh, 
I'd like to thank my own center, the Sandy Center, for assistance in uh, putting this conference together. But most importantly, I'd like to acknowledge Wikimedia Israel and its volunteers for the long, arduous, devoted work put into place to make this conference happen, to make it tick as it is ticking, to make it as interesting and enlightening as it already is and promises still to be. I'd like to make a special acknowledgement for the group of young people leading this, the volunteers and the officers of uh, the foundations involved. Uh, you're doing an amazing job and you're just uh, a subject for my admiration. I, I think it's wonderful. Thank you for doing this. Must mention the visitors from abroad again. It's wonderful to see this international audience. It's this international audience coming together under the spirit of the values of cooperation, free information, universal access that are at the center of Wikipedia. It's wonderful to see this international audience getting together, getting along, working together, creating together, and actually not just enjoying, but leaving some valuable cultural information, intellectual assets for people who will come after us. It is not often that in conferences like this, and I participate in many such conferences, it's not often that in conferences like this that one can be assured that it's not just the energy that is generated when people are here. It is that there will be a legacy left over by this event and these people and the efforts and volunteering involved. A legacy that will be enjoyed by many, many others who are not fortunate enough to attend. It's my pleasure and honor to invite, open this conference, to invite uh, Tom Elashu, who is the chairman of Wikimedia Israel, and one of the small group of dedicated, very talented, and extremely admirable people who put this conference together. Tom I'd like to invite you to address the conference. Well, I have written papers on this technology is she's up. Wow, so many people. Well, as the chairman of Wikimedia Israel, I welcome you all to Wikimedia 2011. Wikimedia Israel was established in 2007. Since then, we were involved in so many interesting projects. We had two wiki academies. We, we lobbied for the, copyright, for the new Copyright Act, and we are now working on releasing all governmental created content to be released in a public license. We also produced a wandering exhibition of Wikipedia that was displayed all over the country, including the Knesset, the Israeli parliament. We initiated a special discussion in the Knesset about the contribution of Wikipedia and we celebrated Wikipedia's 10th anniversary. This whole year was devoted to producing Wikimania. It all started last year when we decided to run a bid to host Wikimania, but we didn't believe we win. But we did, and so the journey began. Um, producing Wikimania... Ah, we started searching for a city to host Wikimania. Haifa was obvious. First and foremost, Haifa is the example of coexisting between Jews and Arabs in Israel. While this may sound minor to you, it means a lot in Israel. Also, for a conference about spreading knowledge, Haifa is excellent. Um, you see, we have only seven universities in Israel two of which are located in Haifa. Third, Haifa has this great venue that almost, it looks like almost it was built to host Wikimania. And fourth, the Haifa Bay, where no, no, no further explanation is needed. So we asked the Haifa guys to support us, and surprisingly enough, they agreed. Encouraged by this, we decided to go to the national level and ask the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to support us. 
they also decided to, to support, and we got the personal letter from the Minister of Foreign Affairs. So we won. Now, organizing Wikimania is about finding, catering, Wi-Fi, buses, cameras, videos, and all the other stuff that the conference needs. This was an endless process of interviewing and evaluating suppliers. Um, everyone contributed something. This guy found an excellent offer for the shuttles, and that girl ordered this person. It's like, producing Wikimania is like writing in Wikipedia. Everyone contributes some, and then the result is astonishing. The volunteers did it all. There are over 650 people in this room. You came from 56 countries. This con conference is about knowledge, about free knowledge. We are offering you 125 presentations in five parallel tracks. The conference is about inspiration, to inspire others and be inspired. We hope that you'll take the most out of it. On behalf of Wikimedia Israel, I welcome you to Wikimania 2011. Enjoy. There is an infographic making the rounds this morning on the internet with four pictures. The title is Data, Information, and Knowledge, and the pictures are of uh, some flour, some eggs, and the subheader is This is Data. Another picture of a recently baked cake, and the title is This is Information. And at the bottom there is a plate that is empty with only a few crumbs left and the title is Knowledge. The uh, implication, I think, is uh, it's not enough to have data, it's not enough to have information, we need to have knowledge, it's not enough just to have a good search engine, we need to have put into place the systems that not only allow us to find things, but also allow, allow us to use them, put them to good use. I've been asked to make two technical announcements, and they're both not just technical, they actually have some value behind them. One announcement is to repeat that the hashtag for this conference, the hashtag we'd like to encourage everyone to use, is Palestine Wikimedia. Please use them on your various uh, social networks and so forth. Palestine Wikimedia, sorry, Palestine Wikimedia. Please be encouraged to use them on, on the various uh, social networks uh, so that we can even further enhance the spirit of community and collaboration. Now that I've encouraged you to use this, I'm, uh, I can make a second announcement, that is that there is no internet in this hall. Uh, for, but, this, but, but this is uh, an intentional choice on the part of the organizers to get everybody's attention focused, at least for the next few minutes until I finish speaking, and then the internet will come back on. So if you didn't come across, I was by way of apology, we know that there is an internet that it will be coming up. Soon. It's a great honor to uh, invite, host, and present to you a uh, member of the Knesset, uh, Midish the former uh, minister uh, in the government of Israel, is a friend of the spirit expressed in Wikimania and Wikimedia. Uh, he has a long list of accomplishments related to the notion of knowledge, copyright reform, and the like. Member of Mr. Shikrit is uh, credited, among other things, for having initiated a discussion of Wikipedia in the Knesset on the occasion of 100,000 articles in Hebrew Wikipedia. It's an honor to welcome you, Member of Mr. Shikrit, and uh, we're all waiting to listen to you. First, to congratulate the Kimania uh, people and group of here from all over the world. Welcome to Israel, welcome to Haifa. Haifa is a beautiful place, just one of the beautiful places in Israel. And I'm glad to be here with you today. 
I would uh, like as well to say that when I was a little boy, it was many years ago, my dream was to buy an encyclopedia. And I had to fight with my parents that I demanded for them to buy for me. And it's a great the prices was high, the income was very low, it was very difficult to have a sick bed, which cost a lot of money. After years of uh, finding at that time, remember we didn't have any television in Israel, there were not many possibilities of entertainment. So I was from one of those boys and girls who was reading as the main Israelis. And the last they bought for me, and kind of encyclopedia at that time, they called the young technician. And I got this uh, beautiful uh, serial of books. I read them from A to Z, all the books, which give me a lot of knowledge about science, mostly science. My dream was to bring to every child in Israel, and if possible to everyone in the world, an encyclopedia. And I thought that it could be done, I speak in 1999, when I was Minister of Finance. I called up the chairman of the Center for Technological Education, and I asked him to develop a CD-ROM, which would be an encyclopedia on the CD-ROM, like the Grolier or uh, Britannica, etc. And I was willing to finance whatever it cost, and give it free to every child in Israel, to every child in Israel. And they could not deliver. And now, Wikipedia, from my point of view, realized my dream much better than I thought. I think one has to understand the big contribution of Wikipedia to the world. Many, many children in the world, and also in Israel. The parents have the ability to buy for them books, or to give them encyclopedia, or to give them possibilities to study on the right way. Wikipedia created this opportunity for all the world that people can come get into the, through the web, to the Wikipedia, and learn about every subject they want to. It's open to everyone, and the beautiful thing about it, it is updated all the time which is not correct for an encyclopedia. Usually who remembers those who have the old encyclopedias like Britannica? They have to publish every year a new book for updating what happens during the last year. Now in Wikipedia it is updated all the time. It is the most accurate encyclopedia because every subject in the, this uh, Wikipedia can be criticized by others, can be corrected by others, can be exact. On the last point, it will be exact. So you get the best information you can get. And everything done from the point of view of the people who are using it, free, free of charge, free of any obligations. They can get in whenever they want, get out whenever they want. They can write in, they can contribute to the Wikipedia. And I would like to salute you. That's the reason I can, to salute Wikipedia for this big achievement for the world. You know, in order to use Wikipedia in the best way, we need a big, uh, we need a very good road. And I'm sorry to say that in Israel, even we are considered to be a superpower of internet, superpower of high tech, still Israel is struggling with the problems that we have in this area. I think that our infrastructure is not good enough. It's like we have people who have a formula, cars, but they have no roads to drive on. We have to improve very seriously the infrastructure of the internet in order to really to let the people surf with the speed of 100 megabytes compared to the average of between 2.5 to 4 megabytes in Israel, which is very bad when we're speaking about download, I'm not speaking about upload, which is much, much more slow. So we have to develop this kind of infrastructure, we're working it, I'm fighting in Knesset and government in order to really make a big progress about it, in order to create different big road which will be open, give the possibility to people to surf fast, immediately get into the internet. Secondly, we have to lower, lower the prices that people are using the internet. Just uh, this week I was uh, uh, marking the fact that uh, when I compare 
the price that the Israeli pay for the, those services like internet, cable TV, and telephone together, the triple case between France, for example, Israel, find out that in France, people are paying for 100 megabyte internet speed, 450 television channels, no limitation of telephone calls from home, 30 euros a month. The Israelis, they pay in the lowest company, which suggests the triple, three times more. And that one, five times more. That's totally unjustified. And it's happening because the government is not open enough really to create inside a very good competition and give possibilities to those who want to lower the prices because it is important. And for example, the main fact was that when new people want to come to this area, they put instead of the, in front of them a lot of obstacles that they have to put a lot of money as guarantees, I would give them the guarantees at present if they were willing to make those prices in Israel. That's what we need to do. Because we have to give it to make these possibilities to every child in Israel to use it. It has a lot of influence about the future of those children. Because today, internet can use for a lot of, not only for Wikipedia, you can learn from long ago, you can have the best lecturer all over, on every subject you want through the internet if you have the facilities to do it. So there is a long, long work before of us. Another thing that I try to promote is really the possibility to give up the IP of the government about all the documents which are not secret and about pictures of the government, which is stupid in my opinion, not only that. I'm, I'm glad to say that the law had passed permanent call, it's now in the discussion committee for the first call. I will not let it down. I will keep fighting until it will come up. And remember that. Even if this government will not for it, I will keep fighting in the future because it's just a matter of time until we come back to the government. Then it will be come up. I'll be personally responsible to do it because I believe it is important. And I would like to say, to say thanks to uh, Mr. Wells, to Mr. Sue Gardner, and the chairman of the Israeli Wikipedia, Mr. Tumar Shur, for the good opportunity to giving for us in Israel to see these beautiful people which come from all over the world. I wish you the best in the future. Thank you. Folks, when we first started discussing who will be keynote speakers at this event, we had absolutely no idea that there will be a protest camp, a compound of tents just outside uh, accompanying this event and maybe even uh, coloring it in a different way. Nevertheless, I think we invited the most appropriate keynote speaker to make the connection between subjects discussed inside this hall and matters and developments occurring just outside, adjacent to this hall. I think we're honored and we will all be very, very much enriched by listening to the keynote opening talk by Professor Yuchai Benkler from Harvard University. Yuchai will make Yochai will make, so I am sure, the connections between what we all think about, care about, and invest in, all the way to this morning's headlines. It has always been a very important part of Wikimedia and Wikipedia to correspond with ongoing modes of thought. The connection between knowledge, its value, and its price. The role of economic models. The role of regulation. The role of government involvement. All of these have always played an important role and helped shape the values of neutral point of view and good faith and the like. Never have such deep thoughts been recorded as well as in Yuchai's previous book, The Wealth of Networks, in which the achievements of Wikipedia were already celebrated early on in the 
progress of this movement. Yochai is uh, going to see the publication of his next book. What is it? Next week? Next week. And in some ways, his next book is a second round and, I would hope, a statement of triumph of some of the values that we all hold. Uh, I'm not going to steal his message, but I am going to say that, uh, what is it, coming up uh, next year, the date where your famous bet with Nicholas Carr will uh, finally come to uh, fruition. Uh, so maybe this can be the first celebration of Yochai's uh, unambiguous victory in that bet. And it's uh, a, a delight uh, on my part to have Yochai and have an opportunity to have a sneak peek to his uh, current thinking. Those of you who haven't seen it, there's a special issue of the Harvard Business Review where some of this stuff is written down for those of us who prefer writing. Uh, and one more announcement before uh, I officially invite Yuchai, just to remind everyone that after Yuchai's talk, we will split into two tracks. There will be a uh, continuation in this hall, and there will be a continuation at the beginning of the Israeli Wiki Academy in the Cinema Tech Hall, beginning following Yuchai's talk. Folks, join me in welcoming Yuchai Begler for the opening keynote talk of Wikimania 2011. It's extremely exciting and a real privilege to be able to come and talk uh, here uh, at Wikimania 2011 uh, in Haifa um, to this um, uh, incredibly exciting and large uh, um, uh, meeting of uh, some of the people who I think really give the world an inspiration about what is possible for human beings to do together. Um, we're meeting, as, as Shezaf said, uh, right outside, uh, people are standing, sitting in tents, trying to claw back a sense of what a decent society and what a decent community can be within a market system, beyond simply maximizing the returns to capital. We're sitting barely a few hundred kilometers southeast of where braving enormous threats, Syrians are going out and asking for their dignity to be recognized, for their humanity to be recognized against overwhelming threats that I think very few, if any of us, can really imagine what they might be like. And perhaps it's cheapening that effort to connect it to you to us, to what we do, but I don't think it's disconnected. I think the Arab Spring that brings forth this effort, I think the movement uh, outside brings together not only, we focus on Facebook or Twitter or how people connect to each other uh, technically to get together, but not that. It's the understanding of the capacity to work together to overcome structures of a hierarchy, structures of markets that necessarily reduce us to supply and demand curves, to say we can share in our common humanity to do something together, be it create a body of knowledge for the world or create our own democracies. And that's really very much of what's been uh, 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 my focus in the last few years. When I first uh, wrote about uh, Wikipedia, it was, actually, it was exactly 10 years ago. It was in the summer of 2001. Wikipedia, as you can imagine, had about 2,000 uh, uh, articles. Um, and I was responding to a moment in uh, the intellectual debate, particularly in economics uh, uh, in uh, the United States in particular, that had, was trying to understand what the story was with open source software, with free software that had just really come into people's field of vision a couple of years earlier. And the basic answer was, there's this weird tribe of people. They're called hackers. They're really weird. <laughs> Don't pay attention to them. Uh, or there's this really bizarre thing called software. It's so quirky, people produce it in a way that no one ever could. 
but ignore all of that because we know what the real uh, model is and that's a market for people who respond to incentives, go after prices and produce things at a quality. And the thing that really happens is you get more efficient markets from the net. And what I wrote in that piece in Coles Penguin uh, 10 years ago was, no, actually free software is just the beginning. What we're seeing instead is a massive decentralization and creation of a new modality of production online. And I'll speak for the first five to seven minutes uh, about that moment, um, <clears throat> where people actually can come together and create together in a third modality of production alongside markets and the state. And where I am today is trying to understand essentially is it just about what we can do on the net? A lot of the first half of this de past decade was, is this real? Will it survive? And for that, it was important to generate reasons to believe that there was something special about this space called the network environment that made it possible what we knew to be impossible elsewhere. Well, today we're older. Today, anyone who still asks the question of is it possible can be ignored because of you. The next question is, does it stop at the door of the net? And the answer out there is no. So the question is how we connect these two, and that's really what I'm trying to do, um, and what I'll start talking about uh, today. So <clears throat> there have been people trying to build, uh, uh, there have been people trying to build uh, amateur uh, cars uh, for a long time. They've never threatened uh, uh, they've never threatened GM or Toyota because of the core physical capital necessary to produce an assembly. The same was thought to be uh, with this uh, uh, thing. So pretty cool business model, 32 volumes, leather bound, several thousand dollars, you have to buy it. Um, and the revolution, two of the greatest information economists of the 1990s, um, wrote this book, Information Rules, and in their second chapter they said, Here's, if you want to understand what the future of the net is, look at Encarta. It is going to change everything because if that's the new model. You see, 39.95 in 2000, that's going to change. It's going to be integrated with the operating system. It's about network effects. It's about richness and interactivity. And in fact, lo and behold, uh, in 1998, Britannica has only $500 in 12 volumes. And several years later, Shane Shane's by CheapSoftware.com, uh, $29.95. But of course, that framework was simply unable to understand that which everyone sees their own vision in. You, Wikipedia. Because it was impossible. It was impossible. And yet, it moves. And as it moves, it changes everything for all of us. What I came to learn as I thought about these things, what I think many of us today understand, and this was the core when I spoke at, at, uh, five years ago at Wikimania in Cambridge. Um, uh, this was what I focused about. This was the message that we learned that was special about the net, and I think is still true about the net, but, but it's not enough, as I'll, as I'll uh, say when I'm, uh, uh, by the time I'm done. The most important input into the core economic uh, uh, activities of the most advanced economies are widely distributed in the population. Both material, computation, communication, storage, sensing, uh, uh, capture, and human insight, experience, uh, creativity, perspective, presence, as well as the social capabilities able to put, get us together and develop processes. Essentially what happens is that the same behaviors that we've always had as human beings, but have been peripheral to the economy, as human beings in society, social motivations, cooperation, friendship, etc., moved from being important to who we are as social beings, but peripheral to who we are in organized society, in the market, in the state, to becoming an increasingly important part of who we are in the market, in the state, in the production system, not the market uh, and the state. Essentially, 
If you think along dimensions of centralized versus de decentralized and market-based versus non-market-based, we can think of four major transactional systems or frameworks. The price system, firms, governments, and organized nonprofits, and families, friends, localized efforts in the social economy. And essentially, throughout the industrialized period, because of the high cost of capital, the bottom is what was occupied, centralized capacity to raise enough capital to be effective, like that GM plant, um, and, uh, 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 and the rest was more on the periphery. Essentially, what we've seen in the last decade, decade plus, as the legitimacy of decentralized network production rises, we see all three quadrants moving to accept the rise of network-based social sharing and exchange, both on its own two feet, like Wikipedia, and in processes with all of the others as it stops being a puzzle and starts becoming a solution space. So if you think of uh, classic things like Wikipedia or like uh, GNU Linux or like PHP or, or whatever it is that you want to see up in the quadrant of social network, uh, uh, um, uh, of network uh, social uh, organization, we see that. But we also see its integration into the other systems. We see efforts like Citizens Connect, like Transparency in the Sunlight Foundation to actually uh, uh, combine networked social motivation with the nonprofit or the government and participation in government. We see some big firms trying to connect to free and open source software, the classic example and the most integrated ones. We see smaller firms essentially leveraging the creative or insight or opinions of people all around uh, the world into what are new uh, uh, entrepreneurial models that then eventually obviously grow and move to the bottom quadrant. Uh, of centralized firms. But the critical point at this point that I want to make is that networked social production, peer production, has moved from being a puzzle that can be ignored to being a central part of the solution space for whole classes of problems. And obviously it doesn't happen only at one level. It's not only about knowledge. And you see integration of multiple layers of, of recursive cooperation generating solutions. If you look at Mushadini, for example, what do you have? You have a Kenyan blogger putting on a, a, a request, look, we have violence here. Let's find a utility that actually allows us to identify. Then you've got uh, expats, Kenyan expats in the U.S. developing things. Somebody else checking in and saying, actually, you have to make it focused on mobile phones because that's the only internet connectivity or only real connectivity there is. And within less than a week, you have a model that's free software, up and running, integrating at that software layer all the contributions of creativity. On top of it, um, uh, uh, a model of reporting on violence that's about everybody observing and then connecting, matching it up with maps that again give real-time information. And what moves from an ad hoc solution to the Kenyan violence through the fact that it is open, available for creativity and modeled on distributed cooperation becomes the foundation of what is in many senses the future of disaster response or needed disaster response everywhere. Whether it's fires in Russia that the authorities don't look after, or whether it's snowstorms in Washington, D.C., where residents are trying to basically say, here, this street is blocked. They're using this Kenyan development system, developed system because of its recursive use of cooperation from the technical layer to generating the information to then distributing it all free and freely shared on a model that is truly global. That's the power, and it's become now the solution space. <clears throat> the other thing that happened is in 2006, I put this slide up and said, here's the moment at which mainstream media suddenly understand that to capture what is going on in the world, you can't believe that you'll just add money and more reporters on the ground, because we all have these capture devices with us, and the only images from the London underground bombing were of people in the, in the subway. And then BBC, to their credit, took it 
and introduced it as the central part of their production. By the time of the images from uh, Tahrir, this was already integrated. This was what the, what the world was looking at, was a collaboration between, on one hand, people on the ground telling their stories, and on the other hand, traditional media, knowing that this is where they need to go, amplifying and generalizing. And this interplay, people talk about the Facebook revolution, but the interplay between the role that Facebook on one hand played for people, and on the other hand, Al Jazeera played for generalizing into the Arab world, is the thing that we need to start to understand and learn. How this thing that was a unique nature preserve becomes integrated as a third modality of production together with market organizations that are beginning to open up, together with governments that are trying to uh, open up, creating new models of both governance and production that enable not a perfect world, but a substantially more open framework to allow people to actually participate in generating their message. And we see this, as I said, in all sorts of places. So the question that I want to ask is, can it be only online? And how can we systemize the design of cooperative systems? And the answer to question one will be, of course not. And the answer to question two will be, I don't know. <laughs> well, hopefully it'll be a little better than I don't know. Um, uh, but rather it'll be, here's how we need to start systematizing it, and here's how we need to change fundamentally the way our baseline attitude towards who we are as human beings as part of the solution to uh, uh, how we can begin to uh, develop cooperative systems. So let's go to one of the more extreme versions of uh, the rational actor model. So Gary Becker, Nobel uh, laureate in economics, uh, in 1968 instituted this move towards trying to explain human behavior beyond the market in terms of rational cost-benefit calculation, when he said that deterrence equals the penalty times the probability of detection. You either raise the penalty, which is what we have in the US with, with, three, with three strikes and you're out, or you raise the probability of, of detection by increasing more police, or you do both, both. And if you do that, you'll succeed. On the other hand, what we saw is the rise since the 1980s in the US of community policing. So on one hand, you have the efforts to really raise deterrence for which there's no evidence it's actually worked. And on the other, you have an effort to build a completely different organizational model that's built on a completely different conception of what the problem is. Instead of 911 calls, technically, you walk rather than in a car. You meet people face to face. You talk to them. You try to understand. Organizationally, instead of just answering emergency calls so that all you meet are either victims or perpetrators, you have connected meetings all the time to try to understand what the problems are, where the problems are. You try to learn from people. You build a community relation between the police and the uh, community. Institutionally, you change. You give more discretion to the cops to what is it to focus. Maybe it's not, maybe it's not what you think. Maybe the thing that really matters is uh, making sure that particular park is clean and, 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 worked, and worthwhile, because that's a source of other things. And finally, social, the humanization, the changing of the us-them boundaries on both sides, and the creation of the connection between so we see it, and community policing today is, is in, in, in uh, 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 the majority of mid-scale and larger communities in the United States. It's considered a massively uh, successful program, and in that regard, it's much more successful than the model based on higher penalties. Um, if we move from the state and its relations that can be organized on a model of the Leviathan, of control and penalty and detection, versus the penguin, uh, as it were, the, the, the relationship that, that's human. Uh, we see it even more powerfully in business. And few organizations embody this model better than General Motors did uh, for decades. Uh, and it starts, and this really typifies the 20th century thinking of organization. It starts with Frederick Taylor's principles of scientific management 100 years ago, 170 years, five years ago, that basically said, let's try to minimize the discretion of people to make sure that we get a very accurate production cycle and have lots of process engineers measuring each movement, giving exact instructions of what to do, and then Ford embeds that in the assembly line and we get the contemporary industrial uh, model that we understand on the shop floor. 
That's at the shop floor. Why? Because the problem is another Nobel laureate in economics, Oliver Williamson, uh, wrote the core advantage of the firm is that it can monitor shirking. And the basic assumption is everyone shirks. People on the shop floor shirk, suppliers shirk, managers shirk, and you can build a coherent organization top to bottom based on the theory that people are self-interested and materially driven. So at the bottom, what do you do? You create very precise motions. You have a lot of monitors looking at what people do. You reward and punish based on whether you do it correctly and you fill your quota or you don't. With suppliers, what do you do? You don't create relations of trust over a long time. You always throw to competitive bidding because they'll always try to say the cost is higher, they'll charge more if there's a long-term relationship. Instead, just competitive bidding, put it in the market. And at the top, what do you do? Well, who's going to monitor the person at the top? No one can monitor them, so therefore you give them stock options. You give them stock options so that if the stockholders do well, they do well as well. We know how well that works. This is the model of GM. Now, essentially, what, by the 1990s, this became such a widespread accepted knowledge that, that we saw more and more models moving toward the price system. So firms started to have internal markets, Governments started to rely on market-based mechanism on outsourcing certain government functions. Maybe private schools would be better, commercial schools, maybe something else would be better. We even began to understand questions of family and friends in terms of incentives and getting the incentives right. That was the language we were developing. And then 2008. And my favorite quote from Alan Greenspan in the, uh, uh, in the uh, um, uh, set in, in a House hearings was, I made a mistake in presuming that the self-interest of organizations, specifically banks and others, were such as that they were the best capable of protecting their own shareholders. For 40 years, we held on to this belief in self-interest. It was mathematically proved. It was good. It was a decent predictor. That's how we need to think. But that was the central model. But the other model was there all along. So essentially, for a while, people thought, well, Japanese production in the 70s was very different. And again, like the hackers, it's a different weird tribe. They do things differently. And then, 30 years ago already, in the US, a major experiment occurred that should have shaken things and did to some extent, but not completely, which is GM's, one of GM's worst performing plants, shut down, was open two years later under management by Toyota. Same employees, same union, say union leadership, but instead of 70 process engineers on the shop floor, none. Instead of one person working at each station, teams of four or five continuously improving and talking about what they could do differently for their station. A lot more flexibility, a lot more autonomy. Within two years, it became the most productive plant in the US and has stayed that way, and stayed that way for over 30 years with very high employee uh, um, uh, satisfaction leading to what became Toyota production system as something that is taught all across business schools. You would have thought that that would be uh, the, the solution and things would change. But of course, still tagged as something very special with all sorts of other things because the core belief, the core ideology in self-interest was too strong. And the same obviously happened in that regard with differences in supply relationships, differences in, in uh, uh, pay. These are the two images of the two um, um, uh, chairmen. Uh, of the two CEOs of the two companies scaled to their salaries in 2006. Um, uh, needless to say, it wasn't necessarily uh, uh, for performance. Although there were enough problems with how Kuda ran uh, the order that are responsible to the, to today's, for today's problem. But essentially what we got was two models. A model of hierarchy plus high power intense incentives at the top versus a model of lower power incentives, longer trust-based relationships, more autonomy on the shop floor as an alternative model. So essentially, what am I suggesting? I'm suggesting that what we came to learn from Wikipedia about Britannica is something that in the background we've been seeing for 20 or 30 years in practice, though not acknowledged in theory, from community police, from, from in policing, in uh, some sectors of organizational management, but always done somehow apologetically, always expressed somehow without a core belief, because it ran so contrary to the dominant model of material self-interest. 
So essentially the challenge, the next round of what is the big thing we need to take from Wikipedia, from the network uh, information environment, from peer production, is that we need an integrated approach across lots of domains, not only technical, but organizational, institutional, and social, mutually reinforced design characteristics based on the best evidence we have to build systems for people who are like us. And what does it mean, people who are like us? Well, here what we have is an intellectual arc in many, many uh, 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 areas of, of study that moves from a period of late 50s through late 80s of refining and perfecting self-interest as a model to over the last 15, 10 to 15 years, a re-emergence of cooperation. We see it in evolutionary biology, we see it even in economics, we certainly see it in political theory from, from Downs and Olson and Hardin in the 1950s and 60s talking about just maximizing self-interest to the political system. Uh, in management science and organizational sociology we already talked about. One way of capturing this change is to compare these two quotes uh, from uh, leading biologists. One in 1976, Richard Dawkins is the selfish gene. Be warned that if you wish, as I do, to build a society in which individuals cooperate generously and unselfishly towards a common good, you can expect little help from biological nature. Let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we are born selfish. Let us understand what our own selfish genes are up to because we may then at least have the chance to upset their designs, something which no other species has ever inspired to do. He wants us to be altruistic and cooperative. But he believes that we are not, and that we need to resist. 30 years later, Martin Novak writes in, in Science, perhaps the most remarkable aspect of evolution is its ability to generate cooperation in a competitive world. Thus, we might add natural cooperation as a third fundamental principle of evolution beside mutation and natural selection. That's a shift in a discipline. Not because D Dawkins didn't know what he was talking about. So this particular line may be a little unfair to draw out because it's not that he didn't know that there was already in evolution a lot about sharing, but most of the sharing and cooperation was explained purely in terms of reciprocity, particularly direct reciprocity. You scratch my neck, I scratch yours. Tit for tat. That was the state of the discipline. You could explain all cooperation just in terms of the direct material payoff. Um, but this change essentially replicates this uh, classic argument in evolutionary biology between Herbert Spencer, who, who uh, uh, characterized social Darwinism and the term of survival of the fittest, as a justification for laissez-faire capitalism, right? As secular ways of looking at the world replace the dominance of religion, we went to science to seek insight about who we really are. And the most important response to social Darwinism academically was actually the development of anthropology. So Franz Boas, Margaret Mead, uh, people who pushed against nature and talked about nurture and talked about culture. But even within biology, Kropotkin, in, uh, uh, in mutual aid, uses evolutionary biology to say, no, actually, we see mutual cooperation. So we see 100 years ago this clash between two views of evolution. We see the ultimate dominance of the selfish view and now the reemergence of a cooperative view. But that's not going to lead us to actually know how to build systems. What it does do, and it gets replicated now in all sorts of studies. So you see studies, um, uh, uh, MRI images of empathy. So this is a study basically showing, uh, 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 by Tanya Singer and others, uh, basically showing that when you take a couple and you shock one of them with a, uh, a mild shock, their brain lights up in one way. And then when you shock their partner, their brain lights up in almost the same way, except for a particular portion that actually processes the pain. But they actually physically feel the pain. At least that's the model in the brain. Um, people running experiments with, with oxytocin. So this is the classic model of a bowl. Uh, uh, and there are monogamous bowls that have long-term relationships and polygamous bowls that don't. And there are big differences in their oxytocin uptake. So people are talking about the role of particular neurochemicals in generating uh, 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 a sense of trust and trust uh, uh, and trustworthiness. What you see throughout all of these studies is an increasing range of evidence that, first of all, in some sense, challenges this whole altruism selfishness. Does it? Are we really altruistic if we get a kick out of cooperating with others? The answer is, who cares? 
It's who we are. Of course, much more uh, practical, but still very far from practical application. But a much richer set of, of, of materials comes to us from psychology, from sociology, from anthropology. Um, and a hyper simplistic way of putting it, but at least hyper simplistic, less so than the idea that we just care about material interest and we're universally self interested, uh, is to think of us as having multiple dimensions or multiple vectors pushing on our motivation. Material interests that economics talks about, moral commitments, emotional needs and effective responses, and social motivation, some of which are more practical, like functional social capital, I'll do you a favor today that gets me some probability of a favor in the back uh, later on, more functional. Some of it much more about uh, learning behavior from others, seeing what others do, copying, learning what's the right way to do in social networks. Some of it on solidarity, in the sense of, of what some might call in-group bias, of saying part of my identity is we, not only I. And so I do things for the we as well as for the I. Learn the centrality of the situation, the frame, the system within which I am, and the potential for crowding out, and this is critical. When you try to do things, when you, you can't just add money to an interaction. You can't go to dinner at friends and leave a check on the table at the end and expect that you'll be invited more often. It doesn't work that way. Um, these things can compete with each other. And in each of these uh, disciplines, the critical thing I want to put to you is that in each of these disciplines, over the last 15 years or so, there's been work that increasingly says who are we? We are people who are, who do have material interests. We do care about putting bread on the table. And that does motivate us. But that's far from all who we are. We are moral beings who care about doing the right thing. We are social beings who care about connecting with other people. We are emotional beings that have emotional responses to something and say, this is what I want to do in this thing. This is what I do. And we need to build all of these into our model of motivation. And because, A, many of us are different from each other. One of the things you see repeatedly in the experimental work that's being done is that there's some portion of people, a gestalt number might be about 30%, who do behave like homo economicus. That's a lot. You might need quite a few of them. But it's not a majority. And there are others who will systematically be altruistic, maybe 15 to 20%. That's a lot of them. You'll meet them too. And then there are a lot of people in the middle who are extremely sensitive to the context and might be one or might be the other depending on what. The core thing I want, uh, uh, if anything, uh, to come out from a design perspective here is that for a long time when we, eat, when we internalize the fact that we should look at the world through self-interested rationality, get the incentives right, we were building the world for everyone for what was optimized for maybe 30% of us. At the expense, and this is the critical point, of denying the self-motivated possibilities from 70% of us. So how many people told you that this was crazy and would never work? Can you count them? You can't count them. 30% <laughs> was Jimmy's answer. <laughs> you win. But in so many ways. Um, impossible, and yet it moves. So, what do we need to do? Um, what we need to do is um, uh, understand two things. Let me actually just put these up. What we need to do is two major things. We, as people who talk about how we should know ourselves in the world. The first is concept conceptual. From accepting that rationality means, or at least is well modeled by accepting that everyone has more or less the same motivation structure, and that motivation structure is reasonably well modeled by material self-interest, to understanding that we are quite different and quite varied, both among each other and in different contexts. There are different moments of life, different moments of a week, where we might be more self-interested and less so, more sensitive to social motivations and less so, uh, that we are diverse internally and among us, that we are, and that the preponderance of us are motivated much of the time by pro-social human, uh, uh, humanity, 
a pro-social sense of being together. So the first is conceptual, beginning to really let go. Wikipedia is not a puzzle. Wikipedia is who we are. The puzzle is why we allowed ourselves to build for so long systems that depended either on hierarchical monitoring or on markets, and instead of rejecting them as insufficient to occupy all of who we are, embracing them as refined, rational, scientific ways of designing systems for who we are. And the second, and intellectually much harder now, although in some senses perhaps uh, emotionally less difficult or historically less difficult, is to, is to focus on design, on designing cooperative human systems based on behaviorally realistic things that come out of actual observation in the field, out of experiments, out of uh, uh, anthropological work, historical work, behaviorally realistic, evidence-based design, integrating multiple disciplines, susceptible to testing and implementation, whose building blocks are communication or framing in the situation, who matters, I, thou, we, zen, empathy, and solidarity, who is right, what is right, what is fair, and what is normal for the particular situation, accepting that calculation matters, that material and social rela uh, uh, relations also matter, uh, and critically, and I'll spend a few minutes on this after uh, this slide, subject to potential negative interactions between material punishment or reward and social relation motivations, and a variety of other social, uh, 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 social uh, dynamics uh, that we all know are critical and we need to learn more about, trust, transparency, reputation, social networks, leadership, asymmetric contribution, the fact that it's not free riding when some people contribute a lot and some people contribute less. It's the way a system works if it's going to work because some people are more motivated on this dimension. There's a different role that you play. I don't need to tell you, I, 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 Jimmy was saying yesterday, the one place that he stands up and he knows that everybody in the room knows more about Wikipedia than he does. Uh, I certainly <laughs> will stand here in this room and accept and embrace uh, uh, that fact. Um, um, but all of these things need to be integrated into how we build the future so that we're not doing hit or miss. That we be begin to connect our design interventions with the basic science of human motivation. Critical to uh, understanding the importance of uh, designing based on our understandings of social and, and, and moral motivations is understanding that you can't just add money. Um, because if that's not true, then in principle, the economists are still happy. Everything else in the mess, just add money, and you'll increase and decrease motivations. The roots of this debate are very old um, uh, and classic in, in, in the Titmus arrow debate of 1771. Richard Titmus wrote a book about blood donations. The UK system was all volunteer. The US systems were primarily paid. UK systems had fewer uh, uh, failures in supply and fewer contaminations. US had more. And Titmus wrote that that was because, essentially, good donors were being driven out by the monetary incentives in the US system and, um, uh, and uh, uh, bad uh, donors were being brought in. Kenneth Arrow, major economist, Nobel laureate, said, no, 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 you're getting it wrong. Maybe the money is drawing in bad guys, but the motivations of the people who want to donate are completely independent. They've got nothing to do with it. And since then, we've had decades of experiments which the major meta-analyses suggest, say, the evidence is on Titmus's side, not on Arrow's side. What might be the mechanism? So if you remember what I talked about with regard to the various vectors, if you just think of them as, as directed forces pushing us towards certain action. If you imagine the standard debate, basically it says material interests will go to give uh, blood, moral commitments maybe go to give blood, but social connections and signals, if people are paid, why am I doing this really? Do people think that I'm doing this for purposes of being a good person? Do I signal to myself that I'm a good person by doing this? Not really, because there's a market for it. So that essentially, if you take away the material interest, you lose the drive to give blood, but you gain much stronger a sense that it's the right thing to do, much stronger the sense that it's socially the right thing to do, and, and much more of a sense of yourself or the kind of person you are. I do certain things, that is what makes me virtuous. That is how I know that I am virtuous. That's the, uh, that's the affective model. 
Um, a nice study in 2008 actually tried to uh, uh, measure this specifically in blood. Most of the other studies were in other uh, things. Uh, done in Sweden, where the baseline is, is uh, voluntary donation. Essentially, uh, uh, donors were, being pay were paid 50 krona in order to uh, uh, um, register for donating blood. And what the uh, researchers found is that, uh, in fact, you got a decline from 52% donation to 30, uh, although the, the uh, numbers for everyone were not statistically significant, they were only significant for women. So then they said, well, what if it's social signaling? What if they let people donate it back? And in fact, what happened is that all of the motivation suddenly aligned, and you came back to the original level of contribution. Interestingly, you didn't actually get more contribution. So all of the transaction of giving money and having the money given away didn't affect overall levels of contribution. What it did do was it at least showed us, you could actually glimpse how even in this era that's the classic debate, material interests actually undermine motivation, but in ways that we don't fully understand yet, in ways that seem to work much more importantly for women than for men. In that particular study, maybe if you replicate the gender effect will change. There's a lot of fascinating work done now about, about uh, gender differences uh, in this model, um, uh, and that's the model that we're talking about. So what we're looking for, again, as I said, Behavior realistic, evidence-based design, integrating multiple disciplines, susceptible to testing and implementation. And that's what I talk about. So then we've got communication. Right, so absolutely central in all the experiences of communication is not cheap talk, the way economists like to talk about it, but it's actually central. And obviously, um, um, I, I don't need to tell you. I love this one. Right? What does hmm do in a text? You can't actually read that without hearing a human voice, can you? Hmm. There's a humanization that occurs before anything else in the act of communication. And through it, so much more as well. Communication is absolutely central. And as we're beginning to see more places trying to actually systematize social software and design for, co for cooperation, we begin to see, like, for example, uh, here in this, uh, yeah, uh, 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 how to is talk like a person. Right? Talk, first of all, and talk like a person. The idea that what you're trying to do is make sure instead of rationalizing so that you ignore the person and, I and create incentives for somebody who's a utility curve, talk like a person, communicate. We see it across again. What I want to get across is this is somehow that we're, the systems that we built don't fit. So in reality, people are pushing against them across many dimensions, trying to build better systems. We haven't yet quite developed an intellectual way of talking about it that is anywhere like the equivalent, either in its precision or in its general uh, acceptance and application as a basic cultural assumptions that the rational actor model does. And that's what we need to build. So we have litigation where there's a lot of arm's length, counsel, defendant, your honor, great distance, and a great movement. And as you read, if you read mediation handbooks, what you see, the first thing is sit like human beings and talk. And let people talk about what they want to talk about. And obviously, we see this uh, 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 in Wikipedia as well. Framing, absolutely critical. Another beautiful experiment by Lee Ross and, and several other uh, collaborators done both in the US uh, and Israel. Essentially, they took a prisoner's dilemma game and uh, the same exact incentives. If people cooperate, they both go home with something. If both defect, they go home with a lot less. If one cooperates and one defects, the one who cooperates goes home with worse payoff and the one who defects takes everything. And that supposedly captures a lot of situations that we're in. Um, where people can cooperate and then be taking advantage of uh, or not. The thing is, the only thing under the traditional model that should matter is what's actually the incentives, what's the payoff to the different behaviors. So they took a group of students in the US, a group of pilots in Israel, uh, uh, Air Force pilots in Israel, and they basically put them in a context where they gave them the exact same game. They told one group that they were playing the community game. They told the other group they were playing the Wall Street game. The group who played the Wall Street game, 30% open cooperating and didn't quite sustain cooperation over the course of the game. The group that was told they were playing the community game, 
play cooperative and sustain cooperation throughout the period. Why? We don't quite know. Probably they thought it was the right thing to do. To some extent, they thought there was less of a risk that people would take advantage of them, and so they actually did what they wanted to do, which is cooperate. Uh, and interestingly, which one of these you told them they were playing, even though they had the identical setup, was more predictive than when they asked their teachers or their dorm masters or their, or their, their commanders in the army what they predict for each person would do. Because once they moved out of whatever context they were and they were that kind of person into a context where they were told, this is the Wall Street. Okay, I'm supposed to make a lot of money. Okay, I'm going to try to do that. Um, but to me, this captures also so much of what's at stake in getting the right understanding. Moving from a world in which we design for everyone and make them mostly behave like those 25 or 30 percent or however many they are, in this case 30 percent, to a world in which we design for us and also are worried and concerned about making sure that some people won't take advantage of it. I, mean, I don't need to tell you what it means to protect this commons from people who want to abuse it. So much of the work goes on. It's not that it's not important. It can't be the pure organizing theme. That's the critical point. Empathy plays a very large role. In that regard, one of the, my favorite uh, uh, experiments was done by Iris Bonnet and Bruno Frey at, uh, in Zurich. Um, uh, they had a dictator. Essentially, they gave one set of people some money, and they said, you can give to those other people as much or as little as you like in a closed envelope. No one will know what you gave, and no one will know who got it. There's zero incentive to give anything. When it was completely anonymous, 26% of the endowment was actually transferred on average. 28% gave nothing. So interestingly, even when there was absolutely nothing at stake, only 28% gave nothing instead of just walking away as the traditional model would predict. When all they did was say, stand up, each one of the people in the other crowd, you don't know who's giving to you, but the people who are in the giver side actually see the face of the person who they will or won't be uh, 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 defective, who they will or won't be sending home saying, I won't give you anything. Only 11% after this gave nothing. All they saw was a face. And when they got a little more information about the hobbies are, who the person is, what they do, again, there's no accountability. No one knows what you give. None gave zero. None. And 50% of the endowment was, uh, uh, was handed over. Pure empathy. And of course, we see this, right? Look at you. You're all here face to face, meeting the other human being. People fly for thousands of miles to meet face to face on a business transaction that has all the big contracts in the world around it. And yet, there's the sense of the face to face communication, the sense of the common humanity that needs to be exchanged with food sharing uh, wherever we do it. And obviously, again, I don't need to tell you. You need to teach me about how central uh, the sense of self is and knowing who the other person is. Then there's the question of group identity or solidarity. And that there's a lot of work going back since the 1970s, looking experimentally uh, at the role. There's work uh, uh, in, in economics, uh, Sam Bowles and Herb Gintes in anthropology, uh, Rob Boyd and Steve Richardson. Um, some of it looking at evolution, some of it looking uh, uh, in political science, essentially showing that people are incredibly connected with each other and actually work uh, 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 and contribute more. So if you've got SEBI at home, uh, the nights you say me used to be when this thing still ran separately, uh, one of the groups uh, uh, that were particularly high contributions uh, and developed their own sites. But like many other things, cooperate doesn't mean nice. Cooperate means non-selfish. Group solidarity is not necessarily always a good thing. It's very often in-group bias against the other. So none of these, my point is, cooperation doesn't always mean nice. Self-sacrifice can be the suicide bomber every bit as much as everything else. We need to be cautious. We need to channel all of these pro-social motivations towards things that we, as human beings, talking about how the world ought to be, um, uh, uh, can channel nationalism, for example, into uh, positive avenues uh, like uh, soccer. Um, people don't think that it's a positive avenue. <laughs> um, I wanted to give you a little bit of a taste. There's more work on 
people really caring about what's right. Again, I don't need to tell you about how important it's been. When, when I wrote in August of 2001, when I wrote the first draft of Coase's Penguin and sent it into Jamie Ball's uh, uh, conference on the public domain, um, what I saw about Wikipedia was unique at the time, was that it was not a platform that was like a, a, that was designed to self-interested people. Slashdot, the other great major thing at the time that was clearly distributed, was built like a game design to make sure that nobody could game the system too much. Wikipedia was, we have a set of norms, we build around them. Now since then you've grown. A lot more institutions has, has grown. These three days are full of studies about the complexities of what it means to translate from this simple core appeal to doing what's right, and here's the definition of what's right here, to actually managing it in such a large scale. It is an amazing experiment that you're running here, that nobody's run. But this core point that we think of from the start was about norms, about doing what's right within this framework, and if you want to do something else, go elsewhere, and do it there, you're free to do that, uh, has been absolutely central. Etc. 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 et cetera. Fairness turns out to be really important. Again, we have a lot of experimental evidence. Uh, conformism matters. Normal, just telling people what's normal. And one of my favorite little things in a study we did on voluntary donation systems, uh, uh, this was magnitude at a time that basically they released the music um, uh, of, of hundreds of artists under Creative Commons, perfectly, you could just make copies and it was legal. Um, for five years of data, what we have is 50%, 48.05% of people who downloaded the music paid eight bucks voluntarily for an album because they were told that was a typical thing to do. It's not a mistake, right? 850, 0.34% are giving. People choose to be either typical or better than average, 12.19% or generous. People take cues of saying, here's what's normal for us. Our habit of action together is thus, and so we develop this virtue. So I think what we're seeing, but what we also need to be really active in pursuing is the retreat of scientific selfishness. Scientific policymaking keeps pushing back on widespread cultural norms of sharing. But the actual practices in the network environment and increasingly in businesses revive this idea of sharing nicely, this broad social educational bent with which we infuse our child-rearing practices as something that's very real to how we live. Diverse businesses and social production models begin to challenge efficiency, efficacy, and growth-oriented effects of scientific selfishness. Science itself is beginning to push back with theoretical, experimental, and observational work. I think what we're seeing is the development of what doesn't quite know itself yet as a new field of cooperative human systems design. But perhaps most importantly, and here we come back to the tents outside and to the people hundreds of kilometers northeast from here. A renewed view of our shared humanity, not at arm's length from each other, but as people who actually care about being social human beings. Thank you. See what you want to do in terms of like, questions. Or, so your your. <laughs> Sorry. So those of us tweeting uh, away, uh, two points. I take away. Yochai, one is, and yet it moves. Maybe a challenge uh, for Jimmy's talk on Saturday, where he's going to, at least so promised, address the issue of will it continue to move. And the other is the retreat of scientific selfishness. Uh, we were promised 125 talks, so it's one down and 124 to go. 
Oh, sorry? <laughs> uh, so let's just go ahead. There's a short break, and we reconvene here and in the small cinematech hall for the Wiki Academy meetings. Thanks again, you applied for a long time. <laughs>